go now to our next uh, guest. Yes, we want to welcome uh, Jim Wallace, who is uh, a, I'm not sure if he's a, a, a still a homicide detective or a former homicide detective, but he's written a book, fascinating, Cold Case Christianity. I love the title of this book. A Homicide Detective Investigates the Claims of the Gospels. So we want to welcome Jim Wallace to the program. And uh, Jim, any particular food that you eat that you'd like to <laughs> confess to? Confess to? I don't think I've ever had an introduction that was quite like that one. I mean, my gosh. Well, it's well thought out. It, it's well I'm thought not sure out, if I well thank planned. Thank you, or if I should be shocked, or I'm not sure how I should react to that. So. Well, Probably all of the above. We just don't want you to hang up on us, Jim. That's basically what we're. <laughs> that's what we're hoping for here. Uh, where, well, where, where are you? A, uh, where do you? Where are you a uh, police investigator? Well, I still uh, work as an investigator. You know, I, I'm in this transition period right now where I'm uh, between. Uh, full-time employment as a detective and working as a Christian case maker now with Stand to Reason, which is a ministry out here in California. Oh, so yeah. I, I'm, running, I'm running time right now between these two lives, and probably I'll always have a hand in investigations. I get asked to consult on, even a lot today on uh, cases that are in my county where they're just difficult. You know, we're having a hard time closing the case, and they'll call me in to take a look at it. So I've got two cases right now on my desktop of my computer for the flight home tomorrow. I'm in Kentucky this week, uh, and I'm going home tomorrow. I'll be reading these cases to review them for, for uh, the officers and the DA. But, yeah, so I'm still involved uh, on a daily basis with these kinds of cases. Yeah, we air your radio show on the weekend on uh, Stand to Reason Radio. That's right, yeah. Oh, so I get a chance to sit in for Greg once in a while. I really mm-hmm. enjoy it. Well, I'm not going to say I enjoy doing it. Honestly, that's a hard show to do because because you have to answer any kind of question that comes in, right? It's not like you get yeah. a, a, to pick the lane. So hey, I want to ask you, I know you've uh, worked for uh, police departments as a detective uh, during your career, or, but, uh, you know, the private investigator TV theme made it big in the 70s, and I was always curious – uh, do those guys really exist? Are they uh, pri- privatized? Yeah, they do exist, and m- much of the time, there are those of us who work in law enforcement uh, professionally. We retire now. We retire pretty early in our fifties, and then you know why we do that, by the way. Uh, cops in their fifties are about as useless as you know a hundred year old. Uh, you know, it's like a hundred <laughs> years of dog years. Okay, yeah. uh, as you get older, you don't, you're not as able to jump over fences and chase bad guys as you are when you're younger. Right. But anyway, a lot of us who retire end up working uh, in some form of private investigation. You know, so. So they are out there, and they uh, are usually hired. You know, a lot of times they'll do uh, marital infidelity issues. They don't, they don't always do. It's very rare they actually get involved in criminal cases because that requires a set of resources that really you kind of lose touch with once you step out of this profession. You have to be uh, careful. Just one more question on the side. Yeah, yeah, I was wondering, if you're a private investigator, you don't have the authority that a police in, uh, detective That's has. That's right. Absolutely. I mean, you're just a so private not, citizen out there, you yeah. know. So you can't just, you know, go break in somebody's house. I mean, or, you know, serve them with a well, search warrant. Well, you're not going to write search warrants. You're not going to have access right. to criminal labs that, uh, you know, we access now without any additional cost. I mean, these are things that are expensive if you were to do them privately, but are part of what taxpayers uh, contribute to and makes it possible for us to do criminal cases. So, yeah, it's very difficult yeah. as a private investigator. Well, let's, uh, let's turn to your book because um, this uh, – and we did want our, our folks to understand that you are – uh, have been a homicide detective and still do a lot of investigative work. And the reason why that's important is because your book is called Cold Case Christianity. It says a homicide detective investigates the claims of the Gospels. And you actually in this book uh, use some of the same kinds of uh, ideas or, uh, you know, I don't want to say theories, but at least theories of examining evidence and uh, and uh, how how you separate um, this from that and what is reliable and, you know, the, you know, the, the chain by which evidence comes to, uh, to, uh, to that, to, to good use in talking about the Gospels. Why don't you explain a little bit about this approach? Well, I think it's got some similarities if you think about it. Working, I work cold cases, and these are cases in the distant past, usually my cases from like 1979 to 1988. You've got issues related to uh, available witnesses. Typically, I don't have an eyewitness who is living who can tell me, oh, yeah, I saw him do it. If that was the case, it wouldn't be cold. I also don't have cases that uh, have the benefit of forensic evidence. I don't have any DNA cases or cases that have been assisted by a slam dunk set of fingerprints at the crime scene. All of my cases 
cases are circumstantial, uh, being uh, pieced together with a circumstantial case that's built cumulatively, put in front of a jury, making a claim about an event in the distant past. Well, this is what we're doing when we look at the events around the first century. You know, did Jesus really resurrect the dead? Are these reliable eyewitness accounts? We've got an event in the distant past, no living eyewitnesses, no forensic evidence. We have to build this case the same way I build every cold case. So I do think that these principles of cold case investigations do cross over and help us to make a case for the Christian worldview. Hmm. Um, you know, when we talk about uh, in, in, in some of the materials that uh, we got from uh, those that are promoting the, the book, you've had a lot of cases that have been, you know, featured on Dateline, Court TV, and Fox News. <clears throat> as, as you uh, examine some of the, the cold cases, and I, that's, that, by, the, by the way, that's one of my wife's favorite shows, Cold Case. Sure, um, yeah. Uh, how... how uh, how easy is it from an apologetic standpoint when many of the people who oppose Christianity, you know, vigorously and they say, I don't believe any of the, you know, you can't, you know, the, the New Testament Gospels aren't reliable. How easy is it when you start presenting the evidence to them? How is it easy to, how easy is it to kind of at least open their eyes? It may not be easy to flip them, but uh, to open their eyes to the fact that, well, maybe this guy is not an idiot who believes in this. Well, I think you make it to a place where someone will say, this guy's not an idiot, but they will not necessarily say, but I, don't, I agree with the guy. I mean, this, this is a, a big difference. And I think that part of the problem is, is, well, twofold. Number one, there are lots of reasons why people will reject a truth claim. Only one of them is rational. Uh, rationality, uh, issues with rational objections, those are out there. I wish that most of our friends were holding purely rational objections. That's not always the case. There are also emotional objections. Maybe you knew somebody who was a Christian who abused you or was an idiot, you know, somebody you didn't like. Or there are volitional objections, the reasons why you would not want there to be. This was my problem. I had strong reasons to not want there to be any other God than Jim. Jim was doing a pretty good job of being his own God. And I didn't want there to be anything else out there. And quite frankly, a lot of it is about presuppositions. Let's, let's face it. And when you go into a crime scene, and I've had this happen where I've walked into a murder scene with a guy who's senior to me who, who had an idea of what kind of murder this was going to be. We walk in, we see it. It looks like it's a domestic violence kind of murder. And automatically he's fixed. Let's find this gal's husband because I'm sure – if she's married or she's got a boyfriend, that's who killed her. Well, we wasted a lot of time on that case because that was not the person who – she did not even have a boyfriend. She didn't have a husband. She was killed by a neighbor. You know? so, so we wasted a lot of time because we held a presupposition, and we wouldn't let go of it. And this is where I was. I, a lot of our friends who are nonbelievers hold to philosophical naturalism. They, they reject anything supernatural, anything miraculous. The minute they read an account of something miraculous in history, they automatically reclassify it as mythology. Or you offer an, uh, an explanation which is supernatural uh, through some kind of scientific process, and they reject it out of hand. They hold to this presupposition, and this is what clouds their investigations. You can't, if you're going to reject the a mere possibility of anything supernatural, then it's going to be awfully hard to start an investigation to determine if God exists or if a resurrection actually occurred, because these are foundationally supernatural uh, beings or events. So you're going to have to, I think, suspend your philosophical naturalism if you want to do this investigation properly. The same way I would have to suspend my uh, presuppositions about what kind of murderer did this homicide before I can accurately investigate the homicide. And that's the biggest, I think, uh, obje biggest uh, burden we have in sharing uh, the truth of this is that a lot of our friends and family simply reject the supernatural out of hand. Talking to Jim Wallace. Uh, Jim's the author of the book Cold Case Christianity, subtitled A Homicide Detective Investigates the Claims of the Gospels. Uh, you have a website. I see you have a website for the book, right? Yes, yeah, it's coldcasechristianity.com, and you can reach me at the Stand to Reason website also, which is str.org. Um, the uh, Christi Christianity, if it's not true... Uh, even you know, I, I'm thinking about the impact that Christianity has had since its inception, two thousand years ago. 
Wow. What a hoax. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. what? I mean, you're talking about theological, uh, you know, you're talking about civilizations being built on this idea. Yeah. Well, this is a good point. I think what you have to look at here is that this is, I always assumed as, a, as, a, as an atheist, as a pretty adamant, uh, obnoxious, you know, pain in the rear atheist and thought I was 35. I, I didn't believe any of this because I was skeptical of people to begin with. Most people uh, in the fresh profession I work will not tell me the truth the first time around. I've got to almost trick them into telling me the truth. And so I assumed from the very beginning that these guys were either uh, lied up front and, and, and did a vast conspiracy, which was pretty dramatic, as you said, or their story was changed over the centuries after they were gone and were not available anymore to say, hey, it didn't happen that way. So the, one of the things we look at in the book, I try to give you 10 principles that we use in cold case investigation. Even if you're not a believer, if you're not even interested, these are 10 principles that you could use in any investigation of anything. And then we take those 10 principles and turn a corner in the second section of the book and apply them to the eyewitness accounts to determine if they're reliable. And one of the things I had to determine up front is were these written early enough to have been written by eyewitnesses? Because if they were, that's helpful. It's helpful because it's harder to lie earlier than it is to lie later. Because if you're lying early, number one, you're lying in front of people who are standing there and would know better if it was wrong, would know better if you were lying. So the early dating of the Gospels was important to me. Were they written early enough to have actually been written by eyewitnesses? We make an important case, I think, in the second section of the book is, uh, that, that, to demonstrate that. But, but even more importantly, what did they say early on? And it, has that changed over the generations as people modified or added to the account, added the uh, miraculous events, added the resurrection, you know, changed the account? And so now we have more than just simple teaching a rabbi named Jesus. We have this miraculous miracle worker who's claimed to be God and now is walking on water and rising from the dead. So I think the chain of custody, looking at how the story changes, does it change over time? John said something. We have an account from John, but how do we know the account we have today is really what John wrote in the first century? Well, we can go to his students and ask his students, what did John tell you? Because it turns out those students, we know who they are in history. They're Ignatius and Polycarp and Papias. These folks wrote letters that still exist today. And in these letters, they describe what they know about Jesus. And we can compare it to what John says in the gospel we possess today. And we can go to the students of the students, Irenaeus, the students of the students of the students, Hippolytus. We can trace the story of Jesus down through history and see if it changes. It turns out it never changes. It's written early by people who were available to be eyewitnesses, and it's still the same story we have today, that Jesus is a miracle worker who claimed to be God, and rose from the dead. Now, this process that you've laid out in these principles, did, did those play a part in your conversion from atheism to Christianity? Yeah, they really did. Now, I, I'll tell you this. Um, I know that uh, I believe that God has to do something first to remove the enmity that we all have toward the things of God. But as this happened for me, I began to take a fair look at the evidence. And this book is really a, a chronicle of my personal journey looking through these pieces of evidence. In the end, I was convinced that the disciples, the apostles' writings, that the Gospels were reliable. But I still didn't even understand the Gospels of salvation. What is it that, that Christianity proposes? Is that, is why, do we, why did Jesus need to die on a cross? I believed that he did, and that he wrote, that those accounts were reliable, that he rose from the grave. But my questions were still bigger. Why did he have to do it that way at all? And I remember laying in bed with my wife and, and staring at the ceiling and saying, hey, I don't get it. I, I, I believe it's true. But do you understand? Because she was not a believer either, you know. She, I said, do you understand why this would have to happen this way? She said, no, I don't. So, so we had to make, take another step. It wasn't until after I was convinced the Gospels were reliable that I started to examine what is the Gospel message of salvation. See, it was a kind of a weird process for me. And it, when I discovered who I was and what a desperate need I had for a Savior, then it made sense what, what, what the Gospel uh, authors were writing about. And I think that's when I began to move from belief that 
to belief in. You know, that's that step you take. It's more than just intellectual assent. It's this trust. It's, it's you taking your trust and placing it in something, some truth to do something for you that you can't do for yourself. That step, for me, occurred after I was already convinced of the reliability of the Gospels. And for a lot of us who are skeptics, that is the journey I hear repeated over and over and over again with the people who now read the book. They'll say, yeah, this is my personal journey, or I know somebody who had that same personal journey of having to be convinced of the Gospels reliability first and then moving from belief that to belief in. You know, Jim, the uh, the Dan Brown uh, approach to uh, Christianity, that this is what we have now is the result of a big conspiracy. Um, do, you th- do you think it was possible for the apostles um, to have created this conspiracy and that was, you know, all went all the way down to the Nicene Council and then, you know, things were changed, right. all that whole, that whole rigmarole that yeah. actually gains in popularity over the last, you know, five or six years. Well, I typically say that I think anything is possible, but that's not what counts in jury trials. What counts in jury trials is only what's evidentially reasonable. <laughs> is it possible? Yeah, of course, because anything's possible, but... It's absolutely not reasonable. And it's not reasonable because folks like Dan Brown probably don't investigate conspiracies for a living. And I do. Many of my murders are conspiratorial. They involve more than one person. And if you've ever had to break a conspiracy to get to the truth of the matter, you understand that there are five principles, five elements that need to be present for any uh, conspiracy to be possible. I won't get into all those details on this. I'm not sure we have time for we that. Have two, but two minutes. This, yeah, we have two they, minutes, Jim. <clears throat> Okay, good. So what they are is basically this. You need the lowest number of possible conspirators. The lower the better. If you have more, it's harder for more people to hold on to a lie than it is for less people to hold on to a lie. You need the shortest possible time span in which to hold on to the conspiracy. A great conspiracy is where two people do a crime. Fifteen minutes later, one guy kills the other one. Great. We had two people yeah. involved, had a very short conspiracy. That probably could survive. The next thing you need, this is critical, is extremely good communication between co-conspirators. So if they're separated and one knows what the other one has already said so he can mimic that person's statement, if they can't talk to each other and they don't know Hmm. what's been said, well, that's a problem. Um, And it makes it difficult to hold on to the conspiracy. The next thing you need is if you've got strong family relationships, you know, it's hard to get a dad to cop out on his son or a mom to cop out on, his son, on her son. Uh, so this is, you might probably won't even talk to you, let alone cop out on each other. So if you've got strong family relationships, that actually helps the conspiracy to survive. And the last thing is, is that, that, that you need to have the lowest possible pressure on the conspirators. If, if no one ever confronts conspirators, they don't ever tell the truth. You know, it's just the nature of it. But here you have a conspiracy which supposedly is done by 12. 12 people holding on to the same lie? That's unheard of. I mean, this is the kind of thing I know that makes good movies and makes good dramas and makes good books, but in practical, it's very hard to get 12 people yeah. to hold on, especially when they can't talk to each other, separated by thousands of miles. Jim, we're out of time. Very interesting. Uh, the website is cold com. Jim Wallace has been our guest. That's the title of the book he's written, Cold Case Christianity, A Homicide Detective Investigates the Claims of the Gospels. Uh, give our best to Greg, uh, and uh, we, we look forward to talking to you again sometime real soon. Hey, thanks, guys. I appreciate your time. All right, very well. Thanks for listening to us today on the